Kirk Docker, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Uh, glad to be here. Mate, we met at the, as several, in fact, you're the, you're the last of the fellow presenters from the outside that I've managed to hoodwink on to the podcast. <laughs> um, but we, we met, I had, because I'm not an Aussie, I had, I had no idea who you are. I don't know if you remember, but we met at breakfast mm. and just struck up a conversation. And the thing, the thing that I noticed was just your energy and that 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 easiness of conversation and it was um a, like an immediate kind of attraction not in the biblical sense i hasten <laughs> to add but so that that ease of communication of you that sort of op have you noticed that if people said that to you before i mean obviously with what you do as a job yeah that would be massively refined without you even knowing but mm. was that always the case that you were easy to talk to and easy to make friends it's an interesting one because i don't think i'm naturally one of those people that um has the quick wit the the instant charisma of someone who maybe at a party um can you know get the girls or you know attract the crowd and that sort of thing um that yeah. that's sort of not what my natural energy is but my I've spent a lot of time in my life as a fish out of water and put in situations many, many, many times, whether it be random jobs I've had, changing schools, um, you know, being in Cubs and Scouts and, you know, did all those different extracurricular activities where um, sometimes I was with my own type of people and sometimes I wasn't. And so I think I had to learn how to survive in those environments and work out how to talk to people in lots of different scenarios. And what I was just thinking then is, you know, I'd forgotten about your accent, actually. And um, I was just thinking then about when we met, and I wondered whether I'd probably dropped in J Jim Steins, who I'd worked with, and um, and oh, maybe yes. talked a little bit about that. And and what I realized I did, and I realized this another time when I was up at going to a chocolate shop, Hague's Chocolate Shop one day, and I was thinking about this process that I do. And um, when I was buying these chocolates from this this uh, staff member, the machine didn't work, you know, the, the, the FPOS machine. And it instantly reminded me of a time when I worked at Mitre 10 down in Melbourne, and I used to work behind the till, and the machine didn't work, and, and the frustration. Of anyway, it wasn't a particularly interesting story, but instantly I sort of talked to this um, shop attendant, and I said, oh, my gosh, I remember this. And we had this struck up, and we had a laugh about this little moment. And I mm. walked away thinking, gosh, that's what I do really, really quickly. I think that's my way around it is very rapidly i find something in common with someone yeah. that helps break that ice shows that we're we've got something in common with each other we might be completely seem completely different i'm a customer you're a staff member we're different ages we're different ethnicities or whatever it is but here's this little common thing that we share that we can bond over that we can have a laugh about or have an understanding over and then it's almost like ah we're a bit the same so I think that that's what I'm quite good at doing and having done this a lot now and, and having practiced at it is I can find a way in really quickly. And I mm. think part of it is that I'm interested, I'm observant, I'm very aware. You know, I'm really, when I meet someone, if I'm in the mood, and I'm not always in the mood, don't get me wrong. If I go to the pub sometimes, I just want to hang out with my mates. I don't always want to be talking to someone I don't know. But if I'm in the mood, I can find something and I can build that rapport really fast and I can make that person at ease and, and then find a way to have a little communication. And then that then sets us off. Yeah, that, that so from a neuroscience lens, I'll add a <laughs> lens to it. When you first meet somebody um, without knowing it, and you'll know this, but you size people up subconsciously very, very quickly. Mm. And our brains tend to put them either in what's called the in-group or the out-group. Right. So um, generally, um, race, you know, it's kind of an in-group and there's an out-group thing, and, and we have these implicit biases around race. Mm. Uh, but... If there is a connection, right? If I hear an Irish accent, boom, straight away there's a connection. Or if you mm. see somebody with the same um, sports team as you, boom, there's a connection. It doesn't matter where you are in the That's world, right. right? And that connection then creates that in-group mentality hmm. um, where you are much more likely to open up to somebody. So you've just been 
doing that neuroscience based thing of of creating rapport through putting somebody into your in group and we have lots of different in groups and out groups right mm. there's people who use like i'm a mac guy fucking hate pcs right <laughs> and so you, you know when you're like that it's like everything that you use is apple orientated right and there's so many in groups and out groups that we have but I just realized we haven't actually done an introduction. Actually, you were just about can to say something. Can I just something, say something we'll on that? Yeah. yeah. Because I think that you can then, if you're wise to that idea, you can choose to let that person into your in-group or not. So say mm. the, cl- the classic one is you're seeing in an Uber or in a taxi and you have a, you, you're having a conversation and maybe the person that's driving you says something that you don't necessarily agree with or that it, 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 it rubs you slightly the wrong way. Now, in that moment, you've got a choice that you can go, screw this, this person's wrong for me or whatever it is, and then they're in your out group. Or yep. you can let that go over your head and then you can tackle it from a slightly different way and then you can find another connection and then suddenly you're like, boom, we've got found a connection. So sometimes if you choose it, it might take one or two or three goes at finding a way in but then when you mm. do, then it's okay. Whereas I think often people go, oh, that person's run me the wrong way. Bang, they're out. Yes. And not realize that actually part of it is finding the right question for the person mm. and and that, that unlocks them. Yeah. And if you can uh, find the right question and unlocks them, then they'll tell you everything. But if you don't, then you might butt heads. So it's an in- yeah. it can be a choice. Yeah, for sure. And so for me, it comes down to self-awareness first and foremost and then something that you said about being interest curiosity i Mm. think is is massive but we are just about to dive down a rabbit hole Mm. Mm. let's reverse and do an introduction (laughs) um so just give us a look look, look, the vast majority of australians will know who you are uh i've got lots of australians in my audience i've got lots of people who aren't australians so just talk about your your background how you then got interested in in becoming a TV personality and and all of this sort of stuff that you do, like where did that start and what's your journey been like? I'm sure there's a few bumps on the road. Yeah, sure. Well, how I describe myself is um, I'm a television producer and an interviewer, uh, a director, I suppose, as well. Um, it's all very fluid in this world. You, you, play, you wear lots of hats. Uh, mm. And I think the, my generation, which is the millennial we came through the thousands where it was the beginning of the internet and internet television and internet media. And it was the predicted death of traditional media. So we suddenly had access to cameras and editing equipment and we could do it all ourselves at home. So you sort of learnt how to do a bit of everything. You learn how to shoot it and edit it and put it on the internet and create your own content. We're at the very forefront of that. I, when I was first making content, I was, putting things on YouTube and YouTube was 2007. The only thing that was on there was cat videos and, and <laughs> hip hop videos. You know, it was very, very, you forget that, that there was a period of time pre YouTube. So I was, my first videos that I made, I actually hosted myself on my own website with a QuickTime player because YouTube didn't even exist. Wow. Um, so I came up in that generation of being able to wear many hats. And so I, I think that's continued. And also there was this sort of, prescribed death of television so I never really wanted to work in this medium television I felt like it was a pretty old school way to work I thought this idea of putting my own videos on the internet was fantastic because anyone in the world could watch it Um, Mm. I didn't have this sort of audience but back in the late 2000s you also there was no money in it it was very very difficult to find money to fund your stuff not that I needed much but you still needed a little bit so I then went into television Uh, I got a fantastic opportunity to move from Melbourne to Sydney and work with a um, a very prominent television producer at the time, this guy called Andrew Denton. He'd had a a, uh, interview show for the previous seven or eight years called Enough Rope. Um, The idea being that if if you give the person enough rope, they'll hang themselves. And his his interviews, he did, God, a vast amount of interviews a year. It was something like 40 interviews a year, um, hour long with different celebrities, but not just celebrities. They were... He would do episodes too where he might have um, taxi drivers on or um, he might have these sort of unusual characters, well, not unusual, ordinary characters, but ask mm. them deep que- you know, deep questions about their life. So I was very interested in working with this guy because I was particularly interested in the interview 
myself. I was interested in asking questions and finding out about worlds that I didn't understand. And again, if you think pre the dominance of the internet, if you wanted to find out about fetishes or suicide or heroin use or all these sorts of um, topics that are offbeat or um, outside the normal taboo, it was very hard to find those answers to hear people really answering those questions. So I was quite interested in finding people and asking those questions. And so I got this opportunity to work with Andrew on this new program called Hungry Beast and moved to Sydney. And um, he was the he wasn't the, the uh, on air talent. We were these young. He sort of found fifteen people under thirty to come and work on this show and create this show. So I was one of those people and in this environment of suddenly making this TV show in a world that I wasn't expecting to be a part of, um, I, uh, I got to suddenly shine, put cameras on, on topics and ideas that I was interested in. And, um, and that's sort of what kicked me off. I was always really interested in making my own program. So from there, I began trying to pitch and get shows up while working on other shows in the meantime Mm. to try and build my skill level up and, and worked on all sorts of different, programs um some reality shows i worked uh for the sydney morning herald um i worked in news for a bit i worked in the canberra press gallery and and a lot of a lot of um finding your way in the media is uh, finding jobs that pay the bills because it's often very short contracts you know yes. it's it's six months it's a bit here, like it's acting three months isn't there. it right when yeah. you're starting to, to to become an actor and and one of my cousins our Carly's cousin's an actor and he's mm. like he's got heaps of odd jobs and gig you take gigs where you can get them particularly when you're you're trying to build a career that's right so i did tons of that what that gave me was a whole lot of skill sets that that i wasn't expecting how to work with different teams how to make sorts of programs that it, that maybe i wasn't super enthused about making but realized there was you know i made this this show called um aussie pickers which was a a ripoff of american pickers which is uh, basically we went with with uh two hosts um and one was an auctioneer at the at at an auction house selling uh, furniture these sorts of things and and one was a buyer and seller of of old wares and these two you know talent would go out you know, this whole show is orchestrated. It's a reality show. It's it's um, so behind the scenes we're finding people who've got these big collections of things, and yeah. we turn up, and we'd go in there, and they'd try and bargain and buy these things off them, and then they'd come back and they'd try and you know sell it for profit. And it was a really interesting learning for me because I came back into the edit suite, and I'm trying to edit these things like it's a it's a documentary. We we arrived at ten o'clock, and then we found this item, and then we found this next item, and this thing didn't work, and this thing did work. And I'm putting these edits together and the boss is like, no, 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 no. Like, this is not how you make these shows. You edit it however you want. Make, uh. if, if the most interesting thing is the thing that happened at the end of the day, we'll put that first. Construct the story in the edit. And, I, mm. and, and that was a massive eye-opener for me because I was very much in the headspace of being very factually correct. But in this yes. world, it's like, no, make the most interesting content that you can. So, and then if you haven't got the lines that, that you need to make that story make sense, well, just write it and then we'll call the guy up and he'll say it. So it's sort of real. That's why it's reality. Like they, yeah. they are doing the deal. They are going to meet the person. They are having these interactions. But how that story unfolds is really up to the producer and, and the editor in the edit suite and, and what you write afterwards. And the better you get at that, the more compelling stories you get. So that was a really, really interesting learning for me to create this thing and understand how this sort of world worked. So even though I didn't really want to do this job, I sort of needed to take it to earn money. It ended up being a massive learning curve. And while in that show, I met another fantastic guy called Laurie Vortier, demolisher down in Victoria. And I pitched a show based off him and then suddenly I had my own show called Demolition Man where we followed this guy around as he smashed up houses and collected stuff and found stuff and, and off we went. So, you know, through doing these jobs that maybe you on paper don't want to do, opportunities come from it. I think that's very much true of this media world. You need to be open to ideas, to say yes to things, work in places that you don't want to. In the meanwhile, you're ticking away on your own projects, trying to get them up. And that's mm. sort of what happened for me. And that's where You Can't Ask That came about because... Um, you know, I was pitching these shows while working on something else in the meantime and, and never really let that flame go out that I want to make my own things, I want to say my own stuff because working in the media is all-consuming. When you're doing it, it's not like a normal job 
be in a corporate world where maybe on Fridays you go out for a long lunch or there's a quiet week, there's a busy week. From day one to, to, to day end, everything's taken, you know, you're, you're flat out. And as soon as the project finishes, boom, you're out and mm. it's done. And then you're unemployed. Yeah. So, and then you, you know, for, for a lot of people, then it's like, well, let's just take the next gig and let's just take the next mm. gig. But if you want to get your own thing up, you're trying to pitch it in the meantime and, and, and trying to make that, that thing happen. So, um, yeah, so so for me, that was because this thing is so consuming. I'm like, if I'm going to give my whole life to this thing, I want to make my own things. I want, yeah. you know, I want to say something. And that's what you have in the opportunity in making content is you have the opportunity to say something. What do I want to say? What point do I want to make? What do I want people to think or feel or challenge how they think about the world? And and, and that's the beautiful opportunity of it. At what point did you realize that you were going to be able to make a career out of this? Like, when did you get a level of comfort, if ever? <laughs> um, look, I was still borrowing money off my friends. I uh, didn't want to let my parents know, but we would we would sort of you know lend each other for rent that sort of stuff probably till about seven years ago um you know that you were down to your last dollar yeah um i think when you always think oh it's when i get when i get the show commission that's then it's safe but then you realize you need to get the second season commission because if you only get one commission then you're screwed getting the second and the third um of one show commissioned and then having a level of that show doing well, people watched it, um, it, it hit a chord, it resonated with people, then doors start to open up. But of course, you still need to have a new idea. So mm. I think there needs to, for me anyway, I needed to have a level of self-belief that this wasn't going to be, this show, you can't ask that, that I'm just talking about now, wasn't going to be my only idea, that there were going to be new ideas that that I was going to stay curious and find more stuff, that I was going to have more things to say. Um, but I think even now, I've had to work out, you know, like you're, own, you're, own, you're your own little business. So you do have to work out other revenue streams. Um, mm. And for me, it's it's doing some speaking. Um, it's doing some consulting. It's, it's, it's working on the things. But I think really at this point in time, I could probably go and work on different shows and, and, and find find my way there's two ways you can go go and work for other people or keep making your own yeah. stuff and i feel like right now um i'm reasonably comfortable with making my own stuff that uh but but no that it, it's not a it's not a career you want to go into if you want um security this certainty is not certainty and security yeah, no. absolutely no but if it's you like, want if you want flexibility and who knows what's going to happen and what does my whole year look like i don't know and if yeah. that excites you fantastic it's this a little bit, little bit like me. Uh, if you are um, pretty high in openness on a personality scale, right? And if you, if you like a bit of change and you like novelty, then yes. those are the sort sort of careers. And and a lot of that's driven by a certain variant of one gene in your brain, the dr four drd four dopamine receptor. Right. The people have certain variants of that actually like novelty they don't like certainty if you said to them this is how your life is going to map but they'd be like i don't Kill even me want now. to look at it <laughs> yes, that's right. so I, that's I, this is built in me this is why i'm like that yeah I, I, well there is it, it, there are definitely traits that come from those genes but they need to interact with the environment right to to whether how, like how, how strongly they are expressed over time but look i really want to talk about the whole art and science of of interviewing and asking questions because i think it's a it's a really important skill mm. for people to develop no matter who they are because human beings are social animals the the, mm. the human brain is fundamentally a social organ and and we know that when you're not interacting with people on a regular basis it does not go well um for your your brain it does not go well for your physiology so mm. let's let's talk about that process of interviewing or or just even having conversations with people so when you are um doing an interview so you you, you touched on a little bit this morning right in in just in uh, already when you talked about when you meet someone you're trying to find a, a connection um let let's 
let's go for planned versus unplanned. So if you're going to interview someone, what's the kind of process that you start to think about before you even get to interview them? Good question. Um, I always have a plan. Well, I don't always have a plan because I sometimes do street interviews, but it, it, to some extent, I still have a plan. I have four questions that I might ask someone. I sort of think of it as this way. It's this idea of planning versus in the moment. And there's an element mm. of both. So if you take the show, you can't ask that. That is an interesting example because um, the show is structured around 10 questions, 10 big burning questions that you want to ask someone who's misunderstood and marginalized. And for your, your listeners who don't know this show, very, very quickly, each episode of the show is... Um, based on a misunderstood or marginalized group of people. So it could be Muslims or people living mm -hmm. with schizophrenia or nudists. Each show features approximately eight people with that label who are all completely different from each other. So it's only people with lived experience, um, but different in ages, ethnicities, belief systems, uh, experience, everything. And that's part of the show to go, here's eight people, same label, all vastly different. We ask them all the same 10 questions and we intercut their answers to show how. You know, and these 10 questions are the questions you can't ask. So nudists, what about unwanted stiffies? Um, Muslims, <laughs> do you secretly agree with terrorists? Um, yeah. <laughs> Schizophrenia, did you smoke too much weed? You know, it, yeah. it, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, when you were a teenager, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in that instance, I go on with a plan. I've got these 10 well-crafted, short, sharp questions. But everything else is in the moment for me. So it's, that's where my curiosity and looking to understand, because everything for me is, if I go step one thing back from what I'm trying to do before the plan, it's like, what am I trying to achieve with my interview? And that's really important to understand what am I trying to achieve with this interaction? Mm. You so need you're to starting, with the, starting with the end in mind. Yes. Right? So there's many things I'm trying to achieve. Um, for example, um, it's asking the questions you can't ask. And, and I've seen, you know, the, my show, You Can't Ask That, is, is now formatted all around the world. Uh, there's, there's over 10 languages, you know, different versions of it. Wow. A and I have seen a version of the show where they ask the questions you can ask. Right. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's, you're failing. Yes. You know, I'm watching it going, you can ask that. that it's that's a not a PC. question you can't ask, right? So first of all, one of my aims of the show is you have to ask the questions you can't ask. And that, that sounds, it, it's easier said than done because sometimes you do write the question, you think, oh my God, that is a horrible question. Mm. That is a really, God, I don't know if we can ask. Nope, that's the show. We have to ask it. And, and is, sorry, can I just ask, it, are those questions formulated like that to get a bit of a wow from the audience and engagement from the audience because you're going, fucking hell, me! did you actually just ask that? Or are they, are they formulated to, to uncover, um, you know, deep personality traits, beliefs in that person or an understanding of why they do or behave how they do? Or is it a bit of a mix it's, of it's, both? It's, or is it's, there it's something both of those completely things. different? It's both of those things because it's, we're making entertainment here. Mm. And, and, and really... This show could have been a yawn fest if, if you weren't careful because we are in an age where asking these sorts of questions, you feel like you have to tippy-toe around yes. the answers, right? And I will get started. to this idea a bit later, this idea of, of, um, of not feeling like, you know, being playful in, in, your, in, in how you ask questions and not feeling like just because it's a serious conversation, you have to put on a tone of seriousness. Mm. Um, so partly we create entertainment, so we want these questions. Secondly, it's about unlocking these answers because everyone has these questions. Everyone's too afraid to ask them. Everyone has an idea then of how this person would answer it, but they never actually ask them. So then these stereotypes exist. Sometimes the most fucked up question, the answer's really boring. Right. You know, but because we've never asked it, we conjure up all these ideas of what that answer could be. But then when you ask it, it's like that. Oh, you're like, oh, is that it? Oh, okay. <laughs> right, and then sometimes a really boring question has a fantastic answer. So they're the, f they're, they're the first two things that, that sort of backing, 
going off what you say. And I say the third thing is, is to demonstrate to the audience that these questions can be asked, that you can ask difficult conversation. You can ask difficult questions if you go about it the right way. Mm. So it's in a way I'm hoping to demonstrate to the audience um, that these aren't necessarily taboo if you do it in in the correct way. So that's probably the three reasons that we uh, the three reasons why we ask those questions that we do. Um, so yeah, to go back to the plan, what am I trying to achieve? I'm, I want to ask the questions you can't ask. I want those in part of my aim. I want those people to answer those questions as honestly. Um, as they can and tell me truths they don't normally talk about. So that's an aim for me is to uncover truths they wouldn't normally talk about. The second aim for me is, like I said, I'm trying to create entertainment. So I want, um, I, I don't give them the questions beforehand. I don't want them to come with pre-packaged answers. Mm, I want yeah. authentic answers. I want real answers. And, and in my interview process, I'm trying to get past that pre-preparedness that people have, that, that safety they might come with and get them to, to speak you know, like they're talking to a friend. So that's a second mm. aim that I have. Another aim I have is to really understand the person. And this is a huge aim for me is to go in looking to understand, not looking to judge. Yeah. Um, and, this, you know, this, this word empathy, you know, everyone thinks that they do, but in actual fact, um, no one actually really does. They, they, they get empathy and, and sympathy confused or they think <laughs> it's, it's compassion and all these sorts of things. Empathy, for those of you out there who... who who may be confused, empathy is about understanding what it's like to stand in someone's shoes. Mm. And I often use the example of a show that we, um, an episode we made on cheaters. People have cheated on their partner. And someone left the comment after the show went to air and said, I can normally empathize with all the people on this show, but I can't empathize with these people. And my response was, what, you can't empathize with someone who's made a big mistake? Because really, at the end of the day, Mm. someone who's cheated on their partner They've made a big mistake. And I've made a big mistake in my life. So I could listen to this person tell a story of a time they've really fucked up. Yeah. Or I can listen to them tell a story about a time they've really hurt their partner. Because I've hurt my partner before. And I can understand what that feeling's like. Or I can tell, hear them tell a story of a time they took a risk and followed love. Because not mm-hmm. all cheating necessarily was a bad thing. Maybe their relationship yes. wasn't going well and they found something else. Or I can understand a story of when someone's done something stupid when they're drunk because someone tells that story. Mm. So I can empathize with this experience they're talking about without agreeing with it. I don't necessarily agree with what they did, but I can get it. And so for me, this understanding is about asking the person, what was it like to hurt the person that you love? As opposed to what people think with asking a hard question, they might come in with looking to, crucify this person how could you do that to someone that you love Mm. and the person that's not looking to understand that's looking to put them in their place to put them down whereas i've got this person in front of me who's willing to tell me about the time they cheer on their partner all the things went wrong and how their relationships fell apart and how family wouldn't talk to them and how they got through it and how they went to therapy and how they learned this thing about themselves etc etc it's an amazing opportunity so I've got a chance to understand an experience here. Um, and so I go in looking to understand that experience and unpack it. And what can I learn from this person through what they've gone through rather than feel like I need to put my opinions on top of them? Um, and then the final thing I really try to you know, do when I'm interviewing someone is, is make it a positive experience for them. Mm. Um, and hopefully ask them something where they consider their own life in a new way and learn something in the same way that you've just done with me have you thought about this idea did you realize that you've unlocked this thing and i'm coming away from our experience right here here having learned something about myself and what a lovely aim in a interaction with someone to to ask something that they haven't thought about so they come away with a lesson you know mm-hmm. so there's many things i'm trying to do and that's all part of the the, the process of before i even go in there having an aim of what i'm trying to achieve with this interaction but if you're you know, someone who's a shock jock or you're someone who is like a current affairs reporter, your your aim might be to get a gotcha moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's different. Yeah. You know, the aims are different um, depending on what that interaction's about. So um, I have this aim. I have, and then I have this idea of a plan, these questions which come out of that aim. My, my questions are built off the back of that aim. And, but what I'm very interested in doing is being in the moment. So here's my question. 
but then what happens after that use my own curiosity use my yeah. looking to understand and then that can take you in all directions and for me this trick is really balancing these two things out just not being so rigid on my plan feeling like oh i went to all this effort to write all these questions on a piece of paper now i have to ask every single one of these questions um and and if you if you're in that mindset then you're not open to going where the thing goes but if you're too rogue with your follow-up questions going way down the garden path Mm -hmm. this interview might be three hours long and you've only done question one so you haven't really achieved what you're trying to achieve either so it's about balancing these two things this plan versus being in the moment and and being able to balance those two and that's sort of how i do it okay so 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 there's the plan and and then there's the art of conversation and the art of of connecting and building rapport right so just for for other people because i think this is a a a really important skill in life is is to be able to connect with other human beings and to to open Mm. them up right and by asking these difficult questions you you are asking them to peel back the layers of the onion so to speak and and kind of let let you peer a little bit into their soul and and Mm. And, you know, a couple of things you talked about earlier, seek to understand. I think it was, I can't remember what it was. Well, Gandhi said, never judge anybody until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Hmm. But also, if you want to be understood, first seek to understand. Hmm. Um, and so, and then you mentioned curiosity. So talk to us about how you build that rapport with someone to be able to open them up to talk authentically because mm. that is is very very key and a, and a lot of people these days they walk around with the layers of the onion firmly shut hmm. so what sort of techniques do you use that other people could learn from just in the whole art of conversation interacting mm. with everybody i think the first thing is to be actually interested to let them know that you're interested in them that you want to hear what they have to say that that what think about this way that everyone's nervous about um doing a good job about being interesting or being funny or being wise or whatever i think of my role as helping this person be really interesting being really wise being really funny how do I help this person as much as I can to be really great? It helps me out because they're better on camera. Mm. It helps them out because they come away feeling like they nailed it, that they were understood and that they made sense and all those sorts of things. So letting the person know beforehand that you're really interested in hearing their story that, mm. um, and, and, and being able to articulate to them why you're interested. What, hey, I'm really interested to, to learn about this because of this. And, and and they go, oh, wow, because I'm really interested. So that's partly is letting them know why you're interested and, and show that you're actually genuinely interested. I think the other thing is is worth understanding, why would they want to talk about this? Um, and, you know, what have they got to gain out of this interaction? Uh, because if you're just coming at it from your point of view, and I was thinking about this beforehand, um, both when I did an episode on people in wheelchairs and amputees, it seems to be maybe the sort of person who seems to be approachable. They've got something physical about them that's obvious and maybe it's not too full on that it seems to be approachable. But both of those, when I interviewed people in in both of those, with both of those labels, they said that people feel like when I'm doing my shopping at the supermarket, they just come up and ask me any question. And that really pisses me off. (laughs) And so here's this person who maybe is being curious and they want to ask something genuinely, you know, that they're generally interested in, but they haven't picked the, the timing. The right moment, yeah. You know, they've grabbed this person and the person's trying to madly do their, their, their supermarket shopping at the end of a week work day and whatever. So it's all very well for you to come at it and, and be interested, but it's also being aware of, of the scenario in which you're asking and um, and is this person is this person open to it? So a lot of my work happens beforehand it's 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 in preparing that person uh for that interaction um at least letting them understand the rules of engagement and and these sorts of things it's again it's 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 setting someone at ease it's reducing that anxiety it's helping them feel comfortable um 
The other thing I do, I suppose, is is be really on. You know, that if I'm going to go into this interaction with someone, I think about it as that this person is the most important person in my mm. life right now. Yeah. No one else. So I'm not checking my phone in the middle of having an interview with someone. I'm not, you know, worrying about in my mind what's happening at home now. There's definitely been times in my life where shit is hitting the fan in my life. But in the interview space, for that two hours, forget about all that. There's no point thinking about it. I can't solve it right now. I have to give as much as I can to this person. And I talk about it as in interviewing with love. I really love this person. I, I want them to be great. I'm on their side. I'm looking for ways to be positive and I'm on. My focus is on them, no one else. And people can feel that when your energy is 100% on them and no one else. Mm. And I'm sure you felt this yourself when you're at a yep. pub and someone zeroes in on you and gives you all their attention. It feels special. Yeah. And because conversely, when you're having a conversation with someone and they're looking over your shoulder constantly, you're thinking, you're not fucking interested. Yeah. Or they're going down, they want to show you stuff on their phone the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That just drives me mad. You know, they're telling you a story and you're being engaged, you're listening, and then they say, let me show you it on their phone. And they, they switch out of the moment and they go into another world and... And, and you sit there in silence waiting for them to, to scroll through their phone to find some picture that they've just spent the last five minutes telling you about that, that yeah. you've already pictured in your mind. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, or, or they take a call in the middle of something or whatever it is. So it, it's, it's, it's giving that focus. It's showing that you're interested and that you care. Um, and it's letting them know um, why you want to have this interaction. Mm. And it's maybe it's also trying to unpack why they might want to do it and finding some common ground in, in why they might want to do it and why you might want to have this conversation too. Yeah, and look at the, the great Dale Carnegie who wrote How to Win Friends and Influence yeah. People. People are like people who like them. They're interested in people who are interested in them. Right? Of so when people show an interest in you and you know maybe some positive affirmations there, that, that really helps with that connection. And then... Motivational interviewing, which we use in health behavior change, there's um, what's called the OARS approach. Um, so O-A-R-S, O is for asking open-ended questions. Mm. A is for giving somebody an, an affirmation to create mm. that connection and build rapport. R is reflective listening, where you actually reflect back what they said, but you're particularly looking for the emotion you know, I can sense that you're frustrated about this or I can sense that you're, you know, you're really interested in this topic mm. because that's like, oh, fuck, they get me, right? Mm. And then the S is summarizing at the end of, of, of the conversation. Uh, and, and that summarizing, when uh, this is specific to behavior change, but you, you are trying to help people to elicit what they call change talk. So, uh, you know, what do you think you need to do to improve mm. your health and then that change talk and then it's like you're picking the flowers of the change talk and you put them into a bouquet and you summarize by handing that back so you're reflecting back what they said right so that little approach is very very useful for helping people to change their behavior and, mm. which is really hard thing to do because it's it's about that rapport building it's about giving them agency and knowing that they've been listened to and knowing that they've been heard and then hearing back what they've said that's super important i, I probably do something very similar but far less structured and the person wouldn't know that i'm going through a process like yes that. yeah that's um, the key right that's when you become the master of your art when you have to do it without thinking <laughs> that that i talk about as as listening and giving a shit mm. and, <laughs> and, and and um you know which other people call active listening but it's it's obviously hearing the words they say but it's taking in the the, the body language mm. that, that they're giving you but i think you make a very good point there it's acknowledging what they're saying is hitting home and I often, and I just caught myself doing it then, I have, because I don't want to talk over what they say, it's a beautiful thing having to interview for television because because I'm behind camera and you never see me, My I'm doing more talking now than I ever do in, a, in an interview. I almost hardly ever talk. Because if I talk, I might screw up their sentence and I can't use it in the edit. Mm. So I have to acknowledge this person that they're saying silently. 
Um, so I have a face that I can acknowledge almost anything that someone says. I can laugh silently. I can give concern. But it's keeps it's it's reflecting back to them. I get you. I get you. I feel that. I understand that. And what that does is it encourages that person on. Oh, I'm. If you're standing there with a blank face, they're going, "Am I making sense? Is this a funny? Is this funny that I'm saying? Are, are, are you getting me?" So the more encouragement I can reflect back to them, I get you. I get you. I understand you. I'm nodding along. I'm I'm laughing. I'm whatever it is. They're feeling like, yes, I'm making sense. This is good. I'm being interesting or whatever it is. And, so, I'm, being, and I'm being heard, and I'm being heard. as well. And, and I actually, understand you. I get you. Yes. And uh, a little story on that. So years ago, I did a, a, a little short TV series. It was called Body and Brain Overhaul, where we took four people and put them through a complete overhaul. But um, I had to do little pieces to camera, right? And it was just slightly off camera where the producer was standing right beside it. And then, you know, there's a side one. But, and the producer, a lady called Tracy Strong, who was awesome, but she she had that face that it was just like, oh yeah, yeah. And, and you felt like you were in a two-way conversation with her. And it didn't really land how much of an impact it had until one day when she wasn't there, and somebody else stepped in and they just had a fucking blank face. And I'm just like <laughs> halfway through, I'm going, this is boring as bad shit. And it was, it was no different. Right. But it's that feedback, mm. that nonverbal feedback that, so I, I totally understand. And, and it's difficult to do without words. Right. Yeah. Like I can do a, you know, I, I I've got a hmm sound. I can almost acknowledge anything that someone says. Like, <laughs> hmm. Mm, mm. <laughs> and you hear I hear it on the rushes when I go back because I'm also mic'd but it doesn't it's not loud enough to, to over you know overturn their mic these little <laughs> you know all the way through as I'm <laughs> you know and just giving that encouragement because um, I look through it what people might know is because because people uh, I interview someone down the lens of the camera um, we have like a little periscope device that sits on top of the camera so they look into the this box and there's a mirror. Yes. Their face gets reflected into another mirror, which then gets reflected to me like a like a periscope. So yeah. I'm looking into a little tiny box. So all they see is my face, like a from just a, just below my mouth to the side and just above my eyes, and that's all they have. And so through that, I have to sort of convey everything to them. Um, it's ex- you know it's quite yeah. exhausting by the you're, you know, there's been times, especially if I've done six or seven or eight interviews in a day, where I'm starting to get tired. You're in a you know studio in the dark and i've started to fall asleep not because they're boring just because i'm tired yeah and you realize yeah. all they're bloody seeing is my eyes starting to shut so you're doing that thing you know when you're tired when you're driving your car and you <laughs> you know you're trying to stay awake but in those moments i have to take a five minute break and 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 re- because that's all they got to look at is my face for that encouragement and mate, that that would be the reason why you're getting tired is you're exerting enormous cognitive control right mm. because you're having to deliberately um, give all that communication, a lot of which would be verbal, and you're having to shut the verbal down and translate it into facial expressions, mm-hmm. which it uses a lot of cognitive control, which is the hungriest part of the brain, right? right? Is, is those cognitive? So th- that's why you feel like you're on a bloody marathon at the end of that. Well, the thing is too. There's there's another there's other reasons I think too is especially if you're having particularly challenging conversations and and. You know, I've done some episodes with people who have experienced domestic violence, sexual assault. Uh, people have killed someone by accident. Wow. And you know you've got this person coming in who is very nervous about talking about this particular thing. But you've done the work beforehand. Um, they want to talk about it. They believe in the reasons why you want to interview them and the sort of content that needs to be a part of. And this is a big learning for me that... Um, if you've done the work beforehand and the person is coming in, they've they've mentally prepared to answer the tough questions. And this is what you've got to understand. If you've set someone up well, that they're coming in to answer the tough questions. So you actually owe it to them to ask the tough questions because they're mm. expecting you to do it and they want to get that stuff out, even if it's hard for them to answer it. And they can always say to you, I don't want to answer that. And then you can unpack that. You know, that's a, that's a different angle. So you need to be prepared to ask those tough questions. But you also need to be so on with this person that you need to be listening so intently to what they're saying and help ask the questions to keep guiding them, t- 
to get out what mm. they need to get. Because if you get too caught up in the emotion of it and you're sitting there going, holy shit, that was so full on. I don't know what to ask next. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yep. So you have to be, and then you have to be just holding this information in your mind because they might drop five amazing hooks, five amazing areas you could go further about. And you might decide, I'm going to go down hook two. That sounds really interesting. And it doesn't quite go anywhere. So you need to backtrack and go now. A moment ago, you said this, and you take them down that path, and then you and you're so you're guiding your because they you need to take charge as the interviewer. You know you can't just let them have a free for all. You need to guide them through this experience and make sure that you get out what you need, but also that they get out what they need. And this has been in the discussion beforehand. So all that I feel like just takes an enormous amount of energy as well. Is is managing all that in your mind while listening to them. Mm. And, and and giving them your energy as well. So it's this sort of, it's this juggle of lots of things. In a lot of ways, it's fantastic. You never have to tell a story about your own life. If you had to do that too, you never get anything out. And that's the beautiful thing about interviewing is that your focus is on them. It's not on you. And it frees you up to not be thinking about some funny story that you need to tell to be accepted. You know, mm. I'm not doing this to be liked or make friends or anything like that. I'm doing it to help get out this, to have this real moment with someone. And, and that frees you up you know this this need to be accepted um that's not part of my aims at all yeah that's interesting and it, for, look i think that interviewing that you do it, it's like podcasting on steroids right so mm. whenever i was first doing podcasts i really struggled with that because you're you're in a conversation and if you're in the conversation you can't help mentally interrupting so like we have normal conversations, you'll say something, I'll think of something and then I'll jump in with it, right? But then you're like, fuck, you know, you can't do that right now because you're, 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 you need to let this person talk. And then you got to be thinking, shit, when are they going to be finished? And what question am I going to ask next? And all of the, and Jesus, it uses a lot of brilliant energy. Like your working mm. memory is going boogaloo at this point, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. I'm so, glad to hear that, that, that I'm tired because there's there's a reason for it at the end of the day, not just because I've done a lot of talking or well, not a lot, of, a lot to, of listening. If you were to look at the the energy consumption of your brain during the interviews would be bonkers, right? It's 2 mm. to 3% of your body's weight, but it uses 25 to 30% of your energy. And when you are cognitively really switched on, it's using even more of that. So if you're doing this for hours, it is like you've run a marathon. It is mm. akin to that. Um, so The poor I, thing I, is when you come home and your partner's like, how was your day? And you're like, <laughs> you yeah, it was fine. You don't <laughs> want to talk, I know. And it's this contradiction. They think, hang on, you spend all day giving a shit about everyone else and you come home, you don't give a shit here. <laughs> Uh, it's very difficult. Yeah. That's it. Get out of that one. So the, where is the line? And, and, and I think we can all um, appreciate this line, particularly when you're having difficult conversations. Where's the line between understanding somebody and interrogating someone? And, and hmm. is there a way that you can keep yourself from crossing that line? Hmm. I think part of it is being aware of your own biases um, Jesus, if you let, have we got time for another podcast <laughs> on that topic? Yeah, because if you can be aware of your biases and not let them infiltrate your question asking, when your biases infiltrate your questions, that's when it becomes an interrogation. Mm. So, um, and sometimes that's useful, but you need to be aware of when it's come in. Um because sometimes people do need to be challenged. If I just go in there completely with the mindset of understand, 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 um, you know, sometimes you might need to challenge a, a thing that someone has said. And those, and those challenges can only come out of your own personal life experience that you, you maybe feel otherwise. But, so, but even in that way, sometimes I might say, look, some people might suggest that this. So it becomes not my my personal attack on you it might be like well this is a a widely held belief but what you're saying could be challenged in this way and how what would you say to that mm. so it's 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 in a way being aware of those things um look i i think that's the main thing i i often go into i i'm curious so 
uh, there's not many things out there that are, that I don't want to understand and, and learn from. And the weirder and the stranger, the better. <laughs> I, I I always had this thing years ago where you know when I was in my twenties and we were creating this content that we were uploading ourselves to the to the internet. Um, we spent a lot of time in in the world of fetish because you know it's fascinating. Yes. And I always used to think, you know, there's a reason why people love pissing on each other. <laughs> you know, golden showers are a thing for a reason. Now, if I go in with the with the, uh, and what am I potentially missing out on by <laughs> by by you know thumbing my you know you know by by turning up my nose to this idea. You got to be yeah, careful so, what you say here. Turning yeah. up your nose to a golden shower. <laughs> That's right. You know. So, what am I potentially missing out on in life by going in with this sort of interrogation? What What can I potentially not? You know, I'm shutting a door to learning something that could be good. I might talk to this person about golden showers, and and something might unlock for me that I might go. You know what? God, this sounds mm. fantastic. I should try this thing out. You know. So I, I often think about this. What am I potentially missing out on by shutting the door? to having this interaction and what can I learn from this person so and that's um, curiosity isn't it yeah curiosity is key with all of this so interrogation is where you lose the 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 curiosity and you're Mm. trying to score a point you're trying to win something over this person Um, like I said I think sometimes it's okay to challenge hey how would you say to this or what would you say to that or blah 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 and hear how they might respond to that um, but that's also coming from a place of curiosity and care. I think if you add the second layer to that is I ask questions with care. Mm. Um, so even if I'm challenging them, I'm still on their side. Um, that, when you, that's, when, that's really important, I think. Yeah. When you lose that care, when you lose that sort of love for this person, that, that you're helping them get out what they need, you're trying to... Then it becomes this point scoring, uh, this point scoring thing where you win, they lose, this mm. sort of stuff. Whereas I'm looking for them to win and for me to win at the same time. Okay. Now, now I, I just want to talk about. So, so we've mentioned a bit of life experience stuff with mm. a, a lot of the people that you 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 talk to, and you know, from the neuroscience perspective, I often say to people your brain is running a personalized hallucination of how the world works and what reality is, right? Mm. Because it is very much shaped by our personal experiences and particularly the strong emotional experience that we had when we were a kid shapes this filter and we all have a unique filter through how we view the world. Mm. Until we take now, magic mushrooms and then it sort of resets until that Until you filter. take, until you <laughs> take, or ayahuasca in yeah, the jungle right. as I did. But, um, so the, I, I, look, that is an interesting thing that, that we can talk about. But having been someone who grew up in Northern Ireland in the 1970s when all the shit was on and, you know, it was Protestant versus Catholic and you thought oh. the other side had two heads. And, and I was actually from a mixed marriage which was right. very unusual back then. So we were brought up as Catholics, but always lived in Protestant neighborhoods. Interesting. And, and you know, when I got older, I just wanted to get out of Northern Ireland just because of the small mindedness. Like there was no racism in Northern Ireland because everybody was too busy fucking hating Protestants or Catholics to care about black people or Indians and that <laughs> sort of stuff, right? But I, I went traveling and did a lot of travel. And I find that traveling... At, combined with curiosity massively opened up my mind Mm. right that was even before i had shamanic experiences but have you found that interviewing people from those diverse backgrounds who and who are misunderstood is there anything that that you can put your finger on and go yes i've changed my mind about this and because of understanding that person yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think that one of the things that I try and do is think that, um, like, I go in um, with the idea of, like I said, uh, finding out. So I don't have the answer beforehand. I, I learned this lesson. I was interviewing people in the street. I was I was doing a, a job for uh, Dementia Australia actually, and I was asking people about um, a memory they never wanted to forget. Uh, I was vox popping people in the street. And, well, what I realized with that question is that I was doing it in the, in the middle of the Sydney there and there was a lot of sort of young parents there. Well, every third person I met said the day that their kid was born. 
And I thought, oh, God, this is a hopeless question because everyone's saying the day their kid was born. And it's the same answer. But then I realized, well, hang on. Well, why is that for them the day they're never going to forget? You know, versus the next person, versus the next person. And then if you actually went one step further on from that, you realize that their answer, well, that was sort of a bit of an automated answer. They felt like they should say it. But then if you actually interrogated that a little bit um, and actually tried to find out why, well, they actually all had very, very, you know, different responses to it. That mm. th- this this initially homogenized answer became a really, really interesting um, analysis of actually it's all vastly um, different in how these people um, answer these questions. Um, you might have to edit this a bit because now I forgot what the original question is. <laughs> the original question was um, about whether there's anything significant or a number of things that you have changed your mind right. on from right. interacting with people, particularly with different belief systems that initially clashed with yours that over time you just went, oh, fuck it, actually. Yeah. So I suppose the first thing how I want to answer that is I, I realized that actually there, there's no one answer to a thing. You know, that the, the person, this person I might disagree with or that I might have a, a different opinion on, um, say cheaters, right? Um, that, oh, here's eight different examples that are all completely different. It's like, oh, so one of the very early lessons of this thing was that each each story is very individual. And, and if you go in with a, a preconceived idea of how, how this person might answer it, oh, the best day of my life or the day I never want to get is how my kid is born. I already know what that answer is going to be as opposed to going in to investigate it you find all this stuff out so that that was the first big one that that um even if i might have an opinion about a certain type of person that each needs to be taken in their own merit because they could be quite different each time one example i think that i was interested in interrogating was um the the issue of pedophilia Um, Mm. and when i went worked on that show years ago um, hungry beast i had a question i thought surely no one when they're born, growing up, going, I want to be a pedophile when I grow up. <laughs> you know, th- th- that's not an ambition that, that people have. So what happens to someone that that happens to them? You know, the, I was very, very interested in finding out um, the answer to that question. Um, and so I did go through the process of finding someone that was diagnosed um, as a pedophile but hadn't offended. And that, that became uh-huh. sort of an important distinction because I thought that my audience might struggle to um, empathize with someone who had offended mm. but if they hadn't but they had these feelings I felt like that, that was a place where they could exist and I came out of that experience having done that interview with a gentleman um, a, a youngish gentleman who you know it was a complex story they had been abused themselves which is often the case right yeah, um, they'd, they'd been stuck in somewhat in a mindset. Um, they had no one to talk to about this mindset that they were stuck in because they felt disgusting, that the whole world was telling them they were disgusting. Mm. And they didn't know what to do. And where do they reach out to? Who do you tell? Do you bring that with your mum and dad? You know, Do you bring it up with your brother? Do you bring it up with your friends? As you get older and, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and the way that you feel um, sexually um, is stunted and you've been abused already and there's already shame around that. And so this this experience became um, a very complex experience, far more complex than maybe that the mass media um, treated it as such. So those sorts of experiences um, for me uh, are constantly changing um, my mind. I feel like I, for every thing that you might find repulsive or wrong or against your beliefs, if you, if you go backwards a bit and unpack it, mm. there's there's a reason you can understand it. So there's not many things that I'm not open to understanding. Um, and and has yeah. what you do over time? Do you think it's created a more of a, an openness trait in you, just from constantly being exposed and asking those questions? Do you find you're getting more open naturally? Yes. Yeah, I, mm. I'm very, very open to anything like that. I, I don't think there's anything you could say to me um, and I'd have a problem with that, that I wouldn't be interested in maybe understanding further if I, if I felt like I didn't understand it. 
And I think this gets to... And I can see uh, both sides. You know? Yeah, and, and that is getting to the crux of, I think, why society is getting worse, or at least certain sections, particularly with social media and the echo chamber. Like, we all have a natural bent that if we want advice, we go and talk to people who are kind of like us. You don't mm. often go and talk to someone who thinks very differently, which is kind of what you should do, particularly in a business sense, right? But mm. then... Now that we're living in this echo chamber where we're being fed the content that we want and we're seeing stuff from people who think like us, mm. I feel that our minds are becoming, or sort of some people's are, more and more concrete. But I think that exposure to difference with a bent of curiosity mm. um, is, is really, really important. So just like on... Just just, just yeah. quickly, like I'm just trying to think of an example of someone that maybe I, w I don't like. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, that I don't dislike. Like I, I follow the American politics quite a bit, and um, you know some of the things that 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 Donald Trump says, and then some of the, his sycophants around him, I really struggle to agree with. Mm. But I feel like if I was to get one of those people in a room and I was to go backwards in understand their life, I could probably understand why they think that way and understand fears that they might have, um, why they're driven, they're probably driven by different fears yeah. um, and all this sort of stuff. Now, I don't agree with them, don't get me wrong. And yeah. I, I would probably struggle to change my opinion and become a far-right Republican. Um, but I think that I could get why they might be like that. Mm. And, and, I, and, and, I and that's the of... difference, I suppose. Yeah, and I look at those, and particularly, you know, you look at Trump, and, you know, part of me just goes, fucking hell, what a detestable human being, and, that, you know, how could anybody vote for him? But there's another part of me that actually admires his marketing genius and mm -hmm. how he manages to pick up and amplify a narrative that is connecting at a deep emotional level with, mm -hmm. with his base, and then is getting this ground swell. Like, you know, he read Hitler's playbook and, and mm. Hitler was a brilliant orator, right? Hate him as though that any rational person would do. You can't help but admire his, mm. his skills in getting to mobilize an entire population based on fears, right? On, on amplifying those fears and then giving them a, a path to get rid or minimize those fears. You well, how much... That's and right. Man genius. But, but also, how much of his life has been driven by fear? Um, how was he treated by his own father, by all accounts, yeah. um, pretty poorly? Um, and how much of his life has been driven by wanting to be accepted, wanting to be loved, yeah. um, and fears of, of looking a certain way? Um, there, there's this great book called How Trump Cheats at Golf. And... Um, <laughs> And there's ah. the guy who wrote it, it, it was a, uh, a Sports <laughs> Illustrated journalist. And he tells a story about how he wanted to do a profile back in the day with, you know, with the celebrity and play around a golf with, not, not, not a pro. And so for whatever reason, um, he decided Trump was the right one. This is years ago. And he's, he starts playing this round of golf with Trump. And, um, you know, this is where he starts picking up all the different tricks. Trump's golf cart goes faster than others. That, that you know, he, you know he, anything under six foot is a gimme, apparently. Right. Uh, the putting green and all this sort of stuff. But as he's going around the golf course, uh, Trump's introducing him to um, different people. Oh, this is the journalist from Sports Illustrated. He's doing a story on me about golf. And, you know, halfway around the round. Oh, this is the, um, the editor of Sports Illustrated. He's doing this piece. Of, by the end of the round, it's like, oh, this is the owner of Sports Illustrated. And he's doing this. And the journalist goes to him, hey, why, why do you keep telling people? I'm, I'm just the... He goes, his simple answer was, it sounds better. Uh, you know? And, yeah. um, and it, just, it just goes to this idea of this this needing to be loved, accepted, um, this big noting of oneself yes. to, to, to feel love, I think. You know, when I did this episode on, on X-Reality TV stars, the overarching theme of that episode was this, this need to be loved, this idea of wanting to go on to this thing. Rightly or wrongly, I felt like this going on this show might 
help them be accepted and loved in life. And I think so, so much of what we do is driven by that. Mm, mm. Um, and so when you start seeing that, you, you can start understanding why people behave the, the way that they do, the self-preservation that they have. doesn't mean you have to like it. No. Um, but but then when they're, when they're in that group, th- their behaviors become amplified, right? Mm. So, and it becomes yeah. irrational and those sorts yeah. of things. E- exactly. Um, so, man, I'm aware of time. I do want to ask uh, um, one question, uh, just kind of along the theme of, of what we've been talking about, which is uh, give some, some people a sense of stuff that they could do with a, a, a relationship that's difficult, where they're, they're, they don't understand. Somebody thinks differently. It could be teenagers, right? Yeah. But it could also be somebody who, who thinks completely differently and you're just butting heads with the whole time. How can we increase our understanding or increase our connection um, with people who are just different than us, whether it's time difference in terms of stage of life or mm. race, opinion, politics, all of that stuff? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I suppose that's where you were getting it before if I had to work out, uh, uh, have I changed my opinion about anyone and, and how, how that approach has been? How do you do this with people that um, that you struggle to find and in with? I think maybe, first of all, you're not trying hard enough. Um you need to find something that the two of you share in common and then also yeah. find something that um, that you genuinely want to know the answer to. So it's, it's asking those questions with care, curiosity, and showing that person you're genuinely in, in, interested um, in them. Um, you're not just interested in giving your opinion, giving your point of view. Um, you're giving yourself over to them in a way. Um, because when people feel that that you're that you're sacrificing your own thoughts and your own ideas and you're butting in with your own your points of view, um, that you're going to push back. And I'm sure yeah, everyone's experienced this with their own partner that their partners, you know, you're having maybe having an argument or, or a differing point of view, and they're saying their thing, and you feel like you need to jump in and justify your angle or your thing as opposed to just hearing them out. Um, and making sure you understand, let them know that you understand their opinion. And if you don't understand it, clarify that opinion to them so they feel like they've been heard. All these things we've talked about before. Mm. Um, and I think that question... And then not feel like you need to come in and solve things. Like, you know, th- this is the thing. In conversations, we feel like we need to solve things or give opinions or tell stories. And Whereas I'm not really doing that at all. It's only about listening and asking questions to understand further i think that understanding piece is is really critical isn't it and and there's a great question is is like if you don't understand them that's interesting tell me more about that uh you know what uh, you know what's driving that is is i i actually think that that is really the crux of it isn't it is is a a a real curiosity to try and understand that other person and what their motives are because mm. that's where you then start to 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 really get them and, and are able to make those connections and not being afraid to look stupid by not knowing mm. you know how many times you've been in interaction with someone and they're telling you this thing you don't know what the hell they're talking about but yeah. you're not alone <laughs> and you feel like you should <laughs> pretend you get it and look if you interrupt every two seconds sometimes that can that can break the flow but I'm not afraid to go, you know, I actually don't know what you're talking about or I don't understand that at all or I've never actually sp- experienced that before. Can you explain what that's like? Um, and sometimes I'll actually do that even if I sort of have experienced it. I'll just... That's the Louis Thoreau method. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's the act dumb in a way. Yes, he's very good at that, actually. Yeah, he does teach me. very well. Yeah, yeah, teach yeah. Teach me. Yeah. Uh, teach me about you as opposed to me I'm give my feeling like I, you. yeah, I know all the answers. Mm. What? Look, I always think this: Why bother interviewing someone if you already have all the answers? Yeah, <laughs> you know. What I mean? So why bother having an interaction with someone if you're already decided? Yeah, get your mind made up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For so sure. it's 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 being open to the difficult thing when it's personal is that there's implications and, it, you know, how might that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to sometimes separate yourself from what the implications of what this person's talking about, if it's got to do with, with you or whatever. 
but I think part of it is being open to hear it. That's the first part. You know? mm. and, I love um, that. That teach me. I think that's that's really cool because mm. that that implies an openness to to learn and an openness to understand as well. And mm. um, last question. This has been super interesting and, and and very helpful. What's next for you? Ah, well, I'm in the middle of uh, editing my new show at the moment, which I'm very excited about. It's called I Was Actually There. Each episode of the show. Uh, focuses in on a moment in Australian history um, and interviews all the people that witnessed it live. So in a similar way to You Can't Ask That, that features first-hand experience, this is first-hand experience. There's no experts or commentators or historians or anyone telling the story. It's only the people who were there and witnessed it. And, and I'm as interested in the Prime Minister's view as I am the cleaner's view. If they were both there and they both witnessed it, I want to hear about what they saw and how it impacted them. So the show is about the moment but it's also about what are those impacts, how did it impact them at the time and how did it impact them over time. So to give you an idea, episode one, or this is not necessarily going to be ordered this way, but the one we're editing at the moment is on the Port Arthur Massacre. Mm, Jesus. Now, th- this is the response. You can't talk about this thing. Mm. What's been interesting about talking to people on this? Well, first of all, I'm not just talking to victims. You know, That's the first part of the story. But there's a lot more people who were there that day that weren't just victims. You had the first responders there. Mm. So a volunteer ambulance driver, you know, like I don't even know that these people existed. In the rural areas, there's volunteer ambulance drivers and and they're not trained paramedics. They know advanced first aid. So, yeah. you know, this elderly woman, she was there. You know, a local GP, she was there. Um, then you had the helicopter pilot who flew in. Well, they're always flying to all sorts of traumas. Mm. You know, so their take on it, well, this is just another job. Then I've got the journalist who spoke to the gunman on the phone and broke that news to the police. Well, her take is, this is the most exciting story of my life. She didn't exactly say it that way, but for her, she's trying to break the news. She's trying to get it out to the world, trying to help the world understand what's happened. She's not necessarily traumatized by being there. Mm. She's trying to find the story. Um, Then it's the hostage negotiator. Then it's the sniper. Well, they're going into very, very, very different ideas of what that day is for them. So, This show is about what is truth and how, you know, a hundred people can be there and present, but all their truths are vastly different. Um, So, you know, history gets recorded on, say, Wikipedia, and here's this top line of what happened that day. 35 people died, this many people were injured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The people who were there, it's muddy. Mm. They don't know how many people died. They don't know what's going on. Some people thought it was a reenactment. Some people run and help. Some people you know run like an animal to get the hell out of there they they just trying to you know uh, preserve their own life and all of this stuff is right none of it's wrong it's just different and and so this show is about understanding what is truth and and how you know in the light we talked about trump before truth has been um assaulted in the last number of years what you know this idea of what truth is we're looking at truth in a different way in terms of truth is in the eye of the beholder and and how yeah, how this can vary and how it also can be correct. So the show's going to be Port Arthur Massacre. We're looking at the Boxing Day tsunami. We're looking at when the Beatles came to Adelaide in 1964 <laughs> and over half of the city, 350,000 people came out into the streets to greet them and the impact of, you know, the 50s were grey and black and white. This guy has this great line. He says, the 50s were black and white uh, and then the Beatles brought colour into my life. <laughs> He goes. I went home one day to my dad. I was wearing this coloured shirt, and he goes, "What do you do? Wear, what do you do wearing that blouse at home? You know." And so, yeah, so he'd come from this short back and sides, and you know. So we're doing that. We're looking at Nicky Winmar pointing at his chest, saying, "I'm black and I'm proud." And what's interesting about that story is two photographers took that photo. Um, one went back to the newspaper and they printed, "I'm black and I'm proud." The other went back to his newspaper and they decided to go with the line, "I had a gutsy game." So here's this moment wow. that happened that was recorded by two different people that could have been obliterated if one person didn't write what the truth was. So, you know, these are the sorts of things that we're covering on the show. So that's going to come out on the ABC um, in the middle of the year. Keep, a, keep an eye out for that. Um, and, uh, and the other thing um, I'm working on is I have a newsletter called Questionable Advice where I write about the, the interview process. Um, and, and that's a really exciting project for me because I don't, I'm not a very good writer, first of all. But also, 
these skills that I, I have, and it's sort of really good talking to you about it because it unlocks things in my own mind. I don't, no one teaches this stuff. You sort of do it, it becomes, um, it, it becomes intrinsic in your own fiber. Mm. But to then go through the process of sitting there and going, well, what do am I actually doing and how do I write about it? How do I unpack this skill? has been really sort of an interesting process for me and I, I really enjoyed it. So um, that that's sort of what I'm doing for fun in a way is is analyzing the interview, some of my own, some of other people's and then writing about it. So they're, they're my two projects I'm working on. Awesome stuff. Mate, I just popped into my head. I'm going to ask you a difficult question that I've never asked anybody on this podcast and you've got 30 seconds to answer. Okay. What would you like to be written on your tombstone? Uh, curious, um, curious, and you know, stay true to stay true to what he believed and um, and did what he loved. Good awesome. dad as well. Good and dad I, and partner. And I would put at the bottom and opened people's minds and opened people's minds. That's good. You know, you could probably. <laughs> I often ask people that question. Um, uh, what do you love about yourself? And you know, people really balk at that. They don't want to talk about the things they love. Um, uh, I'm the opposite. Sometimes I can talk about all the things I love about myself. It's a, it's a, you don't really want a thesis on your uh, tombstone, I suppose. But yeah, they're the things that are important to me. Open people up. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Very cool. Kirk, thank you for your time, mate. You've been very generous. And, and I think there's lots of little nuggets in there that people can use just to, to be a better member of the human race appreciate it and thanks for telling me that i'm using a lot of my brain and that's why i'm tired <laughs> exactly <laughs> go and tell your partner that <laughs> thank you thank you